the fact that biological shapes could be connected um, by geometric transformations to each other, to Darcy Thompson 100 years ago, meant that they were generated by a very orderly process, that they followed very specific physical, chemical, and biological principles. And he called these principles, these internal forces that generated biological shapes, uh, laws of growth, or law of growth. Today we mean, by laws of growth, we mean the entire panoply of various uh, developmental processes, all the way from genes, uh, gene sequences, uh, genes encoding, uh, which are important for development, uh, various developmental pathways, molecules, which are important for cell signaling, uh, the cell differentiation, cell proliferation processes, all the way from uh, how the cells are assembled into tissues, how the tissues are assembled into organs, and how from organs you put together a very complex organism, multicellular organism. So this entire process of development is governed by what, again, Darcy Thompson called the laws of growth. In his mind, the laws of growth were the main force that generated not only any particular biological shape, but also their diversity. It is often believed that Darcy Thompson, um, Dar Darcy Thompson's laws of growth were in opposition to ideas of Charles Darwin. This was acknowledged by his, um, uh, by his uh, peers at the time. Why? Because Charles Darwin, especially his, in his early thinking, uh, the main mechanism for, for evolution for Darwin was natural selection, the process by which um, the most adapted forms survive and reproduce and pass on their genes. Whereas Darcy Thompson believed that natural selection of anything was an impediment to generating diversity. He, he, again, he believed that the laws of growth were the main reason that animals and plants are, are so diverse. So this debate, curiously enough, is still very much in force today and still has not been settled. Why? Because um, for most species of animals and plants that you see around the world, adaptive explanations are perfectly fine. That is, uh, evolution by itself is, not, is, is, um, is a fundamental process that generates, uh, that generates diversity, but the exact mechanisms are still being investigated. And again, for most species, adaptive evolution, natural selection or sexual selection in some examples is, um, is enough to explain uh, their origins. However, there are examples, I would argue, where diversity is so great or uh, is so complicated that cannot be easily explained by environmental factors, uh, that is by natural selection for forces alone. In our work, we focus on some key examples of a process which is called adaptive radiation. So what is adaptive radiation? Adaptive radiation as a term was first formulated by George um, Gaylord Tom, uh, Simpson back in the 1950s. And um, simply put, this is a process by which a single ancestor, a single species, gives rise in very rapid succession to a number of descendants which are morphologically or otherwise diverse. And the main reason why they're diverse and why they evolve so quickly is because they face some kind of available niches. It could be, for example, new islands or it could be new ecological niches, new opportunities which generate a selection um, for new forms, uh, new shapes, and uh, this is how uh, adaptive radiation is produced by, uh, by an ancestor uh, which finds itself in a, in, a, in a new space, new ecological or geographical space, and then very quickly multiplies. Now, adaptive radiation implies two processes. One is increased number of species, uh, what we call species richness, um, which, uh, which um, again, greatly um, is increased during adaptive radiation. And another one is uh, very rapid changes in, in morphological diversification. That is, these uh, descendants, they, they look different from each other and they look different from the ancestor. Um, that this morphological diversification coupled with species richness is what, uh, these are the fundamental processes um, which explain adaptive radiations. One of the key examples of adaptive radiations is uh, the Darwin's finches, which live in Galapagos Islands. Uh, which were instrumental to many scientists. In fact, Darwin mentioned them in, uh, in his uh, Voyage of the Beagle, and he discusses them uh, at length in, this, uh, in his early book in 1839. In fact, he calls them, in, in this book, he calls them the most singular group of, of all the animals in the archipelago, meaning Galapagos Islands. And he was absolutely right, because Darwin's finches are, interestingly, very different from any other species of birds which you find in Galapagos. That is, if you open that modern textbook, Darwin's finches are an example of adaptive radiation, of course, and, and the main explanation for their diversity is because their ancestors arrived to Galapagos Islands, and uh, in the absence of um, competition, in the presence of all the ecological resources, all the opportunities essentially 
were enough for this ancestor to uh, produce very diverse uh, and uh, numerous descendants. The problem with this um, explanation is that Galapagos Islands were invaded multiple times. In fact, they, there were 18 independent invasions of Galapagos Islands from the mainland. There were different species of, uh, many other different species of land birds, such as hawks and owls and warblers and flycatchers and doves and many others which came to Galapagos Islands. Only one of them gave rise to a very highly diverse group, uh, which we now know as Darwin's finches. In fact, out, out of the 28 endemic species and six subspecies, most of them are Darwin's finches on Galapagos Islands. Um, so in many ways, even on this islands, their diversity is very much exceptional. The only other group which is comparable in any way in terms of number of species is Galapagos mockingbirds. There are four species of Galapagos mockingbirds which evolved on, this, uh, on the main islands um, on, on Galapagos, but all of them look very similar to each other. They're slightly different. They're different enough in terms of their plumage and pigmentation patterns that one can distinguish them. Um, and Darwin, in fact, noticed that as well. He used Galapagos mockingbirds in his writing um, uh, on speciation as well. And in fact, Galapagos mockingbirds are an example of what we call allopatric speciation. Allopatric speciation is when, um, is when ancestors arrive to a particular space, they fi the descendants find themselves in geographic isolation, and spending enough time in this isolation, they evolve gradually into, into different looking species. In fact, this is how most species of birds evolve around the world. If you go to islands between Europe, um, uh, between Asia and Australia, for example, there are hundreds of islands with lots of species of birds. Most species of birds evolve um, via this allopatric speciation. That is, you have slightly different species, one, usually one per island, uh, which are slightly different from the species of the next island. That's how mockingbirds evolved on Galapagos. This is not how Darwin's finches evolved because we, have, we find multiple species for each island, which are very morphologically different from each other. So you have a situation where a group of birds is um, evolving the levels of, of um, morphological diversity which are unparalleled. These are truly exceptional birds. Darwin was absolutely right. They're, they are the most singular group of, of land birds on Galapagos. And uh, they still demand an explanation. We need to understand why this other species of birds, which arrive to Galapagos Islands, which face the same opportunities, for about the same amount of time, they have not been able to become very diverse. Um, and of course, another question is, what allowed Darwin's finches to become very, very diverse? And, and um, our explanation is that during the evolution of Darwin's finches, in their, in, their, in their ancestral line, they evolved a novel developmental genetic program that essentially allows them to become diverse. Uh, it's related to a concept called evolvability that is an ability of a species or clade to produce variation. And we would argue that genetically different species are different from each other and some of them are in some, in particular ways, are much more flexible, so to speak. That is, they're able to produce morphological variation. They're able to, um, to produce variation much more rapidly and much more readily than other species living in the same environment. Uh, Darwin's finches, for example, their beak sh the, the program that controls their beak shape is extraordinarily complex. That is, it has many more genes than the programs of, of other songbirds, and um, this allows Darwin's finches to separate different dimensions of the beak. For example, the, the depth can be regulated independently of the width, which can be regulated independently of the length in ways which are not even available to other species of birds. That is, they're able to produce um, different vari variants of beak shapes, um, different versions of the beak um, much more quickly because they uh, they are controlled by multiple genes doing different things. The, that is, the own program in Darwin's finches, the big young program is very, very modular. And this um, significantly increases the evolvability of, uh, of uh, this group. And, uh, and this is what uh, probably explains why they're so much more diverse than, um, than other land birds on the same locations. Our study suggests that it is important to pay more attention to the laws of growth. That is, simple adaptation explanations may work really well for most species, but perhaps not for all of them. Exceptionally diverse groups of species, such as Darwin's finches, or um, Hawaiian honey creepers, or Madagascar vangas, or phyllostomid bats, and all lizards, African cichlid fishes, and there are many other examples of exceptional adaptive evolution. We have to look at more closely at the genetic mechanisms which generate their diversity.
to understand the interplay between environmental forces, because um, we do believe that adaptation and uh, adaptation to environmental conditions and availability of the new resources is indeed um, important, pr probably required part of adaptive radiation, but likely not sufficient. That is, we need to combine the um, genetic forces, um, the, the laws of growth, the development genetics, uh, innovations on the development genetic level with adaptive radiation, with natural selection to explain adaptive radiations that we observe in nature. So we have to look at these um, stories uh, in, from this perspective, from both genetic and environmental perspectives. It is clear that understanding genetic principles of development um, is quite important for understanding the origins of diversity in, uh, in the um, living world. It is clear that in order to produce a new shape, a new biological shape, you have to change something on the genetic level. Uh, you have to change something about the development program. But are we prepared to think, are, you, are we pre prepared to accept that, at least in some cases, the innovation on the genetic level is the driving force for producing dramatic biological variation uh, in examples such as Darwin's finches and um, Hawaiian honey creepers.